that's not right. Come on. See, all I had to do is hit the record button. <laughs> that's when the stragglers come in. Okay. So welcome to week three. Um, by now, you guys should start be starting to be settled in uh, to your first level of college. Um, we're going to dive into data modeling today. Um, and then just to give you guys a bit of a preview over the next couple of weeks, um, the, if I believe if, I'm, if my understanding is correct from the other profs is we're releasing the first assignment to you guys next week so you can start preparing for it. Uh, it is a group assignment. You have to partner up with people in your lab section. Uh, your lab prof is the one grading it. So, you know, uh, make sure you follow their instructions. Um, and then, so this week is data modeling. Uh, the next couple of weeks are more theory-like concepts. Um, depending on how long some of these topics take, um, I might have some time to do some on the board examples, which would be really beneficial for everybody. Uh, we'll just see how long it takes to get through some of these topics. Um, and then you guys are going to have your first midterm the third week of February. So the week before reading week, which I'm sure people are going, well, what's the date on that? Uh, it should be the 21st. Okay. All right, so now into today's content. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about data modeling specifically. Um, data modeling is a method used to document a software system using something called an, an entity relationship diagram, an ERD. Um, basically, it's a visual way of representing the structures of a database. It is used as a way to um, express a, business, a company's or an organization's business requirements. Uh, data models are used for all kinds of purposes, including, because uh, there's three levels of data models, uh, conceptual, logical, and physical. And all three of them can be uh, described using an ERD. Uh, you'll see me use the word ERD instead of any relationship diagram. It's a lot less talking, but it's an ERD. Um, sometimes you'll hear other people just call it an ER diagram, but it's the same thing. So essentially, it's used as a way for data analysts or database analysts and software developers to understand and implement um, the data that happens behind a system. So a data model, also known as an ERD, it's a plan or a blueprint. And a data model is more generalized, more abstract than actual database design. It's easier to change it at this stage because you haven't really committed to it yet. Um, normally, you would use it to do conceptual concepts. Uh, often what I like to do is uh, comparing it to building a house. When you first sit down to get a house built, and you know once you've proven you have money to pay for that house, that you'll sit down with a designer and they'll do a quick sketch of what you think what they think you want. They're not going to do, you know, a detailed blueprint. They're going to do a sketch. I'm going to do a couple of mock-ups, some rendering, saying this is what we're going to do. So that's the conceptual data diagram. In other words, they're discussing what they think you you want. Then the logical diagram, which is the next step, which a lot of database designers conflate logical and physical diagrams because they're almost identical, uh, is more akin to the blueprint that's given to the builders. So today we're going to be focusing on the conceptual side of the deal. So the conceptual diagram and um, basically sketching the contents of a database. So I just literally finished talking about that. So there's three pieces, conceptual, logical, and physical. And today we're going to talk about the conceptual design for the most part. Um, these are just different amounts of detail in a diagram. Good luck. Now you can come on through. 
No, she's going to go around. Doesn't want to be on camera. Um, it's fine. It saves me some editing because I'd have to cut her out. Because I'd have to have a written permission to put her on my channel. So, conceptual diagrams include important entities and relationships. Uh, may or may not list the attributes. Um, so, if it's a reg regular conceptual diagram, there are no attributes. So, remember last week we talked about entities and attributes. Basically, the entities are the things. The attributes are the the data points used to describe the thing. So, like a name of a student. One's an attribute. One's an entity. So a regular conceptual diagram, there are no attributes. It's literally just the entities and their relationships. An extended conceptual will have attributes, and it has a bunch of different kinds of attributes. Or I should say a bunch of different kinds of symbols to represent all the kinds of attributes you would find. Um, in the conceptual diagram, you usually don't have primary keys. Uh, you may have identifiers, but you will not have primary keys. As we discussed last week, a candidate key is an identifier, but it's not guaranteed to be the primary key. It's what during the design process you think is going to be the key. Uh, the logical diagram includes all the entities and relationships among them. So it will take the conceptual diagram, this, flesh it out more. It'll have all the attributes are defined. The primary key at this point has been created and defined. Foreign keys are specified. And normalization will be occurring at this stage. We're taking normalization in two weeks. Just so you know. That one I know exactly when I'm teaching that. So uh, normalization is happening in two weeks. So the logical diagram is basically the conceptual diagram with extra stuff added in. Then you have the physical diagram. So you take the logical diagram and then you start adding stuff to it. Make sure all the tables and columns are defined. In other words, you're converting the entities and the attributes into tables and columns. Foreign keys are there. They're fully described. Um, you may need to actually denormalize at this point. Um, it happens. So the physical considerations can cause a physical data model to be really different than the logical one. Usually not that different, but there are times where physical considerations will make a difference. By physical consideration, that means what is the target database engine behind the scenes? For example, MySQL does certain things one way. Postgres might do something different. It has more features, so there, there's things in Postgres that you can do in Postgres that you can't do in MySQL. Oracle does things that neither of these two do. Therefore, depending on what your target is, you'll have more features available to you in the physical diagram. Thus, the physical diagram might be different from the logical. However, the logical diagram should be pretty much the same regardless of the target database engine. The physical one is the final you know, assembly. Again, it's like back to the house building, building example. You have your blueprint. The builders are putting stuff up. And then as they're putting up the structure, they may realize that um, they might need to use something slightly different than what's specified in the blueprint because that's just how it goes. Um, I've seen that where they say, oh yeah, we got to have an electrical box of this kind here. And then in the blueprint, then they discover in the actual construction that box won't work because there's so many wires going into it that the box isn't big enough to hold whatever the heck's supposed to be there. So they'll do some adjustments based on the actual implementation, physical implementation. So the ER diag model, it's a set of concepts and graphical symbols that's used to create the conceptual diagrams. So the original ER model was created by a data scientist called Peter Chen in 1976. Um, the extended ER model and later add-ons, because they've added stuff to it, um, were made to his model type. And, and essentially, it's extended. Uh, it's referred to as the extended model um, because, well, it adds extra stuff. And this course is going to be using the term ER model, ERD, interchangeably. Whether we're talking about a the original model versus the extended model, I'll be treating them the same because really, <clears throat> the only difference between the original model and the extended model is the extended model has extra stuff on it. Therefore, they both 
contain the same elements of the basic model, it's just the extended add stuff. It's like adding mods to your Skyrim install. The original game's still under there, it's just your Skyrim and mods actually make it look pretty. Okay, so an ERD is a pictorial representation. It's graphical, it's visual. It serves two purposes. Uh, database professionals can use ERDs to describe the overall design consistently and accurately. And later on, the ERD can be transformed into a physical uh, relational schema. Um, depending on what design tools you are using, which you guys aren't using a design tool that lets you do all three. That's just how it is. Um, we used to have one you guys could use and then Dell bought the company and they stopped giving it out for free for students. Good job, Dell. Um, and there is one other one, but it's uh, $1,500 per student. That'd be a lot to add to your tuition for like three diagrams. So we're not. So you're going to learn about these things independently from each other. And when you look at an ERD, there are three components. There's entities, attributes, and relationships. So when that is the three pieces that make up an ERD. So there's variations um, in an ERD. In the original uh, data models, Attributes are shown as ellipses. The um, entity is a box. I swear to God, I did this last week. Because this slide looks really familiar. I did this slide last week. But it, the, yeah, the text is, some, is the same text. So I covered this last week, so I'm not going to cover it in detail this week. But essentially, that's an entity. These are attributes. This is the exact same thing in a box format. And cardinality, I think we talked about cardinality last week too, uh, which is the count. Uh, maximum and minimum cardinality uh, determines how many uh, instances participate in a given relationship. So I, I, I talked about this last week too, didn't I? Okay, let's go. There. Okay, good. I'm like, I'm going, yeah, this, I'm going, I've covered this material. I remember last term I taught this, I go, I swore to myself I'd rip up those slides and I forgot. Okay. So parent-child relationships, uh, I'm pretty sure I covered that too. Those are one of many relationships. Um, and minimum cardinality, we covered that one too. So this we've seen, good, that's going to make today's slides go really fast. Now I'm skipping stuff that we've already covered. And the minimum cardinality is also covered. All right, crow's foot notation. Now, I think I covered that last week, but I am going to go over it again this week because it's actually important. We, this is where we pick up new material. Excellent. Crow's foot notation uses unique shapes and symbols to represent the elements in a database. Crow's foot diagrams basically represent the entities as boxes, relationships as lines. And there's different symbols at the end of each line that represents the cardinality. There are four sets of symbols. And they're listed as follows. There's mandatory one, which means there's one and only one. A good example of that would be um, when you buy, go to Loblaws and you buy some groceries. You, when you finish paying, you get one and only one receipt. There might be many things on your receipt, but however, you have one receipt. So you have one purchase. So each item on the receipt is a, the child records. There's many of those, but each of those only ever belong to one and only one receipt. Mandatory many. A, a, again, back to law of laws. You have, you cannot get a receipt unless you've bought at least one thing. You can have many things, but you can't, can you imagine you go up to cash, you go, I want to pay for nothing. Here's my card. I just want a piece of paper with nothing. It doesn't work that way. So this is known as a mandatory many. In other words, there must be at least one item. There could be more than one. So it's denoted as mandatory many. So the first line is the minimum 
The second line is the maximum. So one and only one, one or more. Now we've got the optionals. So the other one is optional one. And this one I'll use as an example from uh, when you buy something on Amazon. You've checked out your order, but they haven't shipped it to you yet. Therefore, the order exists. However, the shipping method hasn't been assigned to it yet. Therefore, the shipping method is optional, but any item is only ever shipped with one shipping method. Right? You can't, you buy a pack of pens on Amazon, they're not going to ship you the pack of pens by FedEx and Intelcom at the same time. It's either going to be FedEx, Intelcom, Canada Post, you know, drone delivery, whatever. That is the optional one. In other words, it can ever have one choice. However, it's optional at time of creation. Later on, it can be populated. And then you got optional many. So that means that you could have zero, one, or more items associated with it. Um, a good example of that is when they assign me a course. So I will be, I'll, they'll, probably in about a month from now, I'll hear about, what Dan, do you want to teach course XYZ in the summer? I'll say yes. So they'll assign me a course section, but I don't have any students yet. So this course section has zero, one, or more students. At one point, it has no students. And then when they enroll the first student, now we have one, and then we have two, three, 100, whatever it is in that section. So that means there's an optional many. In other words, it can exist. The parent can exist without any children. And it's totally optional whether or not it has children. That is the crow's foot notation and the arrangements of each of the relationships. Yeah. Or null. It's not necessarily zero. Usually optional means it's null. Um, in other words, it's undefined because we don't know. Zero is we know it's zero. It's not quite the same thing. Just like an empty string is not the same thing as a null string, right? Because an empty string is still a string. A null string is not a string. It's a null. So when you look at relationships and they have this optional one and the optional many, that means that the target is probably null. So when it's a optional one, it's usually a single field that has a parent of some sort, such as shipping method. And because it's not defined, it's set as null because we don't know what it is yet. The optional many, on the other hand, means that the parent exists, but there are no child records to go with it. So when we look at the relationship and we have the crow's foot notation in here, we'll have department to employee. And right now there's a few ways of drawing this. The original ER model notation was like this. And then they said, well, you know, the diamond is kind of dumb. So we're just going to do it like this instead and have the full crow's foot notation. There's actually a version somewhere between the two. And the version that's between the two has both the crow's foot notation and the diamond, but the diamond actually, instead of saying one to n, will have a, ver a verb in it. Department assigned employee or employee assigned department, so that this describes how what the relationship actually is, as opposed to just saying it's a one to n, in other words, one to many. Um, one department for ev for n number of employees. And if this exact thing up here can be drawn as below. And I'll point over here for these guys so they don't feel neglected. Um, you can see right here that you got an optional one. So an employee um, belongs to one department or optionally none, but the department must have at least one employee and many employees. So when you read this stuff, when you look at the symbols, the symbol closest to the box is not the relationship for that box, the relationship for that box and how it relates to the other items at the other end of the line. So you will read it from department reads the line before it connects to employee. Whatever's there here 
has to do with the department, whatever. And then if the employee's relationship is over here, so it's drawn the other way. When you're first learning, a lot of people get confused about where to draw your symbols. It's at the, that's one of the big perks of the diamond approach where it really helps break down the connection between the two. But in the end, it's still, the department is over here, the employee is over here. So the whatever opposite end of the line from the object is where the how its relationship behaves. An employee belongs to one zero or one departments. The department has one or many employees. Does that kind of make sense? Vaguely? I literally taught this in my other lecture last week, so I'm pretty practiced this week. Um, so this is a many to many. <laughs> so here we've got N to M because you can't really have NN. So they decided we're going to go NM. I don't know. It's what they decided. So we have optional at this end, one at this end. So an employee has one skill or many skills, but they have, a, they have to have at least one skill. Each skill may belong to an employee or may not belong to an employee. In other words, you have eight developers in your shop. Two of them might be web developers that are well-versed in HTML, CSS, say Python. And the other ones are desktop developers, so they're well-versed in C++ and C Sharp and potentially Python. So there's some relationships that are going to be shared between the two, between you know employees, but not all the skills belong to all employees. But you're not going to have an employee without skills. That's called a waste of money, time, and effort. And if we were to, going to take this and convert it to a standard crow's foot, it'll look like this. It's showing that the employee has one or more skills, and each skill belongs to zero, one or more employees. Each employee has one or more skills. Each skill belongs to zero, one or more employees. This allows us to remove redundancy in the database because we can define Python as a skill once and assign it to many employees. The fact that not all the employees may have the Python skill, that's why it's optional on the employee side. So Python is optional for the employees, but an employee must have at least one skill. Which brings us to strong and weak entities. So there are two kinds of entities in a database. There are strong entities. It's an entity that can represent something that can exist on its own. A good example of this is a person, a building, a car, something. A weak entity is an entity whose existence depends on the presence of another entity. For example, an apartment cannot exist without a building put it in. Therefore, an apartment's a weak entity because it cannot exist without the building that it's in. The building can exist without the apartments, technically, but not the other way around. You can't be a manager without an employee, and depending where you work, you can't be an employee without a manager. Uh, but it's entirely possible to function without a manager. It could be two in one also. So employee manager gets a little tricky um, because in theory, somebody could be hired as a manager and they haven't been assigned any employees yet. And you could have some employees that just got hired that don't have a manager yet. So they can both exist simultaneously, uh, but they are codependent. That's basically how you'd look at it. Um, Another good example of a uh, weak entity would be, um, I had a perfect example just a minute ago too. Give me a second. No, not even departments, not even that, because the department can technically exist. Um, God, I hate when my brain blanks. My brain just erased itself for a second. Um, but yeah, the apartment in the building is actually a really good example. Um, Another good example of a weak entity is um, hey? I didn't catch what you said, but she's laughing, so it must have been snarky. Uh, 
I know it's as soon as I come up, as soon as I, my brain resets and comes back with the example, I'll bring it back up. Um, I'm not going to stand here while I try to remember what I was trying to say. But um, yeah, essentially, well, actually, another good example is a government without citizens. You can't have a government without someone to govern. Regardless of where you come from in the world and what kind of government you come from originally, it's all the same. Okay, so an ID-dependent entity is a weak entity. In other words, it's an entity which the primary key includes the identifier of another entity. And it's basically an extension of the parent. It's a subunit of the parent. So a building has an apartment. You could have a painting or you could have prints. Now, for those of you that don't know what that means, is you'll have a famous artist create a painting. And then they're going to make copies of the painting that are numbered. And those are known as prints, not the counterfeits. Those are sold as the real thing. But you've got the painting and the prints. In other words, you've got a print cannot exist unless there's an original painting for it. An apartment cannot exist without the building. Odds are, the apartment will have the ad the same address as the building. If the building if you're using the address of the building as its key, then the apartment will have the address as part of itself. Um, when you have an ID dependent entity, the relationship is always one. So a building can have many apartments, but that apartment can only ever exist in one building, right? It's not like you can have a, an apartment that exists in two different buildings at the same time. Physics says that can't happen, right? It's physically impossible for something to be in two places at the same time. So this is a perfect example. When you talk about the building and the apartment, the, the apartment can only ever belong to one building, but the building could have many apartments inside of it. So the apartment is carnality of one. And it must have a parent. So it's a one and only one. So when you are, depending on the diagramming software you use, because they don't all do this. I'm just going to say it now. They don't all do this. Um, when it's an identifying relationship, normally it uses a solid line to mark it as an identifying relationship. A dashed line connecting a strong entity and a to another entity is known as a non-identifying identifying relationship. A good example of that is back to my Amazon example with the shipping. Shipping methods can exist on their own. The order can exist on its own. Therefore, the relationship between the two of them is non-identifying. The order is not identified by the shipping method, and the shipping method is not identified by the order. So you would have a dashed line when you're drawing it. And that would be known as a non-identifying relationship. Now, back to this Amazon thing again. You have an Amazon order with three things. Therefore, each of those things in your order belong to the order. So each of your order lines only has one order. Each order can have many order lines. The order lines are going to be identified, at least in part, by the order ID. And that's an identifying relationship. So the apartment and building would use a solid line because it's identifying. Shipping methods would not. Okay, so here's a few examples. And here's our building and apartment example. And actually, there's my example I was trying to remember. Good, there we go. So you have a building and an apartment. So an apartment belongs to one and only one building. The building may have zero, one or more apartments. In theory, when the building is being built and the units have not been finished yet, they're not apartments yet. Therefore, the building has zero apartments. Once they're ready to go, then they have one or more apartments. Uh, painting to a print, same thing. Uh, a painting, a print must have a painting, but a painting may not have prints. That's just how it works, right? So you. Certain paintings out there do not have prints. 
the Mona Lisa does not have a print. On the other hand, the piece of uh, Robert Bateman artwork I've got on my wall has is a print. 219 of 220. And then you got the patient in the exam. That's the one I was trying to remember earlier. So you go to a doctor's office or to the emergency room. God help you if you got to go to the ER right now, but you know, emergency room, family doctor, dentist, optometrist, doesn't make a difference, right? So you got a healthcare professional. You're going there. You're there as a patient. They will perform an exam. So the exam belongs to one and only one patient. So they did the exam. It's tied to your patient record. End of story. Do not pass go. However, no matter who you are, when you first sign up after your very first visit, when they put you in the system, they will have at least one record. They'll have not using the word exam is not quite necessarily the right phrase, but they will have some sort of patient record for you. So the, that is a mandatory one-to-one -one and one-to-many. In other words, you're in the system, you must have at least one kind of health record. You can have multiple and vice versa. Each health record belongs to only one patient. That's the one. So non-ID, um, dependent weak entities. So essentially all ID dependent, in other words, when they say ID, they're talking about identifier, by the way. Um, so there's such a thing as non-ID dependent weak entities. So that's when the identifier of the parent does not appear in the child entity. Um, we got a couple of examples here where we could do it as an ID dependent or non-ID dependent. As a person that writes databases specifically that has to do with vehicles, this, these examples hurt my soul. Um, however, here they're using auto models. So you got a manufacturer and a model and some stuff here, and it carries down these two pieces of the key into the vehicle's identifier, and then it adds an extra little bit. And then you got, you know, the sales date and stuff like that for you guys on this side. So up here, you've got the identifiers for the vehicle, up, for the uh, model up here, and it gets carried down into the vehicle down here. You'll notice that the first two fields in the identifier area are the parents, and then it has its own. So this is an ID dependent. In other words, that child entity down here cannot exist without the identifiers of the parent. The second example we have is Again, the first table is the same. If you look from left to right, it's the same one. However, if you look down here, the vehicle has a VIN number. Does somebody just ask what's a VIN number? It's the vehicle identification number. All vehicles sold around the world have a magic number. That's how people are stealing Hondas and Lexuses, just so you know, because your VIN number is visible through the dash, through the windshield. They got a little app, they type it in, and then they just program a new key and drive away with your car in about five minutes. Um, it's, you know, that's why you don't want to have a Honda. All their keys got leaked. Uh, it sucks if you have a Honda or a Lexus because they're made by Honda. And they have, you know, so you got a VIN. Um, so the VIN, is the primary key of the vehicle. Every vehicle currently in the world, or right, let me actually back up. Okay, every vehicle built in a legitimate factory has a VIN. Uh, there are vehicles built in some countries that don't have VINs, LADA, um, rolling rust buckets. Um, I've actually never seen a LADA with a VIN. <laughs> Just saying. Um, the VIN is a cool thing because it identifies from the code, from the, the VIN number. You can, you know what the, the make, the model, uh, the trim of the car in the, is in the VIN. You can decode the VIN and it identifies what you have, who made it, when it was built and all that stuff. And you can decode past that. Uh, some of the really good VIN numbers, like the North American ones, down to the point where you can know what plant the vehicle was built in. So they'll have a code saying, you know, this is a Ford. It was built in Michigan at this plant by the VIN number. So it's very unique for every vehicle. So in this case, we're using the VIN as the unique identifier. 
And the rest of it's down here. So this is known as a non-ID non dependent. In other words, it's still weak because the vehicle can't exist without a, an auto model. In other words, if it's a Ford Focus, and then you have an actual car, which is whatever the VIN number is tied to, it can't be a car unless it has a make and a model tied to it. Like if it's not a Ford Focus, then that car does not exist. If it's not a Mitsubishi Outlander, that car won't exist because Mitsubishi Outlander does not exist. So it's still a weak entity in the sense that it cannot exist without the parent entity. However, it's not an ID dependent one because the parent's ID is not carried into the child table. Uh, when you go to the physical diagram, there'd be a foreign key in here. So a weak entity is an entity whose existence depends on another entity. We covered that. So it's pretty clear. An ID dependent entity is a weak entity that requires piece of the parent's ID, like parents, basically the parent's primary key to be carried into its own primary key. Um, identifying relationships are used to represent ID dependent entities. Um, some entities can be weak, but they're not ID dependent. Um, and those are shown as non-identifying. Um, if when you start using synthetic keys, instead of actual um, like natural keys, so to speak, like if I go back here, manufacturer and model being carried in here, those are natural keys because they're based on things in the real world. And the manufacturing sequence number would be a synthetic key. When you actually start using synthetic keys, almost everything ends up being a non-ID dependent. Even though they're weak entities, because if you're creating, if you're using um, synthetic keys or surrogate keys, which are generated automatically by the database, suddenly you don't have a need to carry these across everywhere because they don't have a reason to be carried across. Okay, so quick crow's foot notation summary. Oh man, that's a dense slide. So the first is that, so that's an entity using the, the vertical notation. This is showing a one-to-one -one non identifying relationship, uh, one to many non identifying, uh, many to many non identifying, and uh, one to one identifying. You can just see that they, it's really, really pale, but you'll see that they use dashes for all the lines here, and the last one has a solid line. So, depending on the diagramming software you use, it may or may not include the ability to have the dashed lines. So when you guys are doing your work in MySQL Workbench for the assignment, which is what you need to do the physical diagram in, it supports identifying and non-identifying. It'll do the dashed and the not dashed. When you are uh, doing your uh, conceptual diagram, which you also need for the assignment and you'll need for one of the labs, depending what software you choose to use to do the diagram, it may or may not support the dashed lines. So your mileage may vary. And the three relationship types we have is um, between strong entities is one to one, one to many, or many to many. In other words, these are entities that can live without each other. Amazon shipping methods is a good example, which I've used already. So those are strong entities. They can exist without each other, but they can still be related. Another good example would be students and teachers. As a teacher, I'm a strong entity because I can exist without students. It's kind of pointless to have me here without students, but I can still exist without students. And in theory, students can exist without a teacher because you're enrolled, but you haven't been given a teacher yet because you don't know what your courses are going to be. So you're also strong. Next term, for example, you know you got classes coming, but you don't know who your teachers are. So you're able to exist independently from the teachers for next term, and the teachers can exist independently from you. So we're both strong entities. And it's, in this case, a many-to-many -many relationship. So in other words, I've got many students, you guys will have many profs, and it's a strong relationship between them. Um, so really not sure why they insist on using the forms, but when 
here's a relationship and a report showing a one-to-one. -one. In other words, you've got members and the members are assigned a specific locker. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. In other words, you've got lockers and you've got members here at the school. You have students. You have lockers. A locker is assigned to one student for one term. Don't be my daughter. Don't forget to take off your lock. She had to get a new locker because she was changing buildings because all her classes are in different buildings. And she goes, ah, I'll just do it tomorrow. She came and her locker was cut off. And her stuff was taken out. And she had to go pick it up at security. Locker services. So when the term is over, take your, key, your lock with you unless you want to buy yourself a new lock. Um, so locks are one-to-one. -one. To a lockers are one to one with students. In other words, each locker is assigned to one student. Each student can have one and only one locker. That's all there is to it. And if we were going to do it as uh, this style of ER diagram, you'll have the member number, the member name, locker number, locker room, and it's a one to one. A locker can exist without a student, a student can exist without a locker. So they're both strong entities. They're both optional to each other. In other words, does everybody in here have a locker? Or does some of you choose not to have a locker? So no locker, right? No locker. Then we've got others that have lockers. So you got in this room, we have perfect example. And if you go like on the second floor, you'll see some locks don't have, some lockers don't have locks. Those are lockers that exist without a student. So it's a perfect example. So a one-to-many relationship looks like this. And man, these are so dense. I can't even read it on my screen. Um, so this is showing members and uniforms. And that's a report. So if they were going to run a report. But it's showing that each club member has multiple uniforms. Uh, in this case, I'm guessing these are uh, two baseball and two basketballs uniforms. And how would you diagram it? Like this. Let's get away from the eye screen. We'll go to something that's easy to read. You got the member number and their stuff, and they got the uniforms. Again, a club member may not have any uniforms. Maybe they participate in certain events that don't require a special uniform. Or not necessarily events, but they participate in certain things that don't have a uniform. Um, and each uniform potentially could exist without a member because depending on how things are arranged, uh, in some organizations, uniforms get reused. It's kind of gross, but the uniforms get reused uh, from season to season. Therefore, you could have multiple uniforms assigned to you. Each uniform could be assigned to one person at a time. But alternatively, a person may not have a uniform and may not, and the uniform may not be assigned to anyone yet because maybe the uniforms all got bought but they haven't formed the team yet, so they haven't handed out the uniforms. So, and this is a many to many relationship. Um, so, this one's actually an interesting one. Um, so, this is a supplier's form, and it really doesn't lend itself very easily. So, this is a case where you have carts and suppliers. Um, now, based on some comments earlier, some of you may not understand how the auto industry actually works. Now, cars are built out of parts, but that might come as a shock to people. You know, cars have parts, but they do. Now, the cool part is, is that the parts that go into your car may not all come from the same supplier. Even if it's a set of brakes, for example, you get Bosch brakes. They're made by Bosch. Great. However, a garage might have three different suppliers that sell the exact same Bosch brakes at different prices. So it's saying that each part can come from multiple suppliers and each supplier carries multiple parts. Therefore, a set of Bosch brakes, for example, I can buy my Bosch brakes from Mitsubishi. I could buy my Bosch brakes from Canadian Tire. Are they going to be the exact same Bosch brakes? Probably not. But, you know, in theory, they could be the exact same part. 
and that's many to many. And it would be mapped like this. It's like this is hard to understand. This is easier to understand. So a company has zero or more parts. Each part must come from at least one company, or it may be supplied by multiple companies. Again, we can turn it around like this. A company may sell, two or three companies might sell the Bosch brakes, but the Bosch brakes might not be sold by every company. Thus, it's the part is sold by one company or more. Each company will sell zero, one, or more of a given part. In other words, Canadian Tire may not sell Bosch brakes. They sell whatever they sell, AC Delco brakes. However, um, Napa Auto Parts might sell the Bosch brakes. Part Source might sell the bar Bosch brakes. Obviously, Mitsubishi sells the, the Bosch brakes. It just, the relationship depends on um, who sells it. So in other words, the company has carries zero or more parts because they might not carry every part in the catalog. And each part is carried by at least one company, but probably more than one. Brakes aren't a good example. Nuts and bolts are a good example. The, or bearings. There's another good example. Ottawa Bearing Supply off Kent carries tons of bearings. And they carry all kinds of brands of bearings. But however, I can find those exact same bearings potentially at a different uh, parts shop somewhere else. They might not have the same variety, but they may carry the exact same bearings. Okay. Wow, this went fast. Because I skipped half the slides. Okay, so this is the conceptual diagram. You know what? I'm going to start diving into next week's stuff now to maximize this week. That will give me better time to uh, do that. So, so when, actually, first things first, though, when you're doing the diagramming, you have two tools to do the ER diagrams. You've got, you got a few choices. You can use Visio, which I don't know if you guys have access to. Uh, Draw.io is a popular one. Um, However, one of my favorites for ER diagrams is this website called erdplus.com. I'll even, I'll try to remember and I'll put it in the announcement as a potential tool. ERD Plus is cool because it's not written by a company for money. It was created by some department at a university somewhere to, as a companion tool for their textbook. So they gave out the website for free. There's a shocker a textbook company that gave out their software for free. But what's really cool about it is that it can draw up the entities. You can connect two entities and it will draw the relationship for you. You can, let's say I decide to call this entity uh, student, and I'm going to call this one teacher. And now I can go. It'll drive for you using the correct words. Whereas with draw.io, you just got to pick the right symbol and drag and drop it. This will actually put the symbols in for you. And I'm going to show you guys some of the examples of the extended ERD diagram. So, for example, a teacher, we can give it an attribute. We can go uh, employee number. And we know that's probably unique. So you can mark it. And we can also add a name. And here's its attributes. What's cool about this software is that it'll move all the objects with it. Now, one more cool part is this. I can add address. Now, an address is what's called a composite attribute. A composite attribute is an attribute that's made up of multiple pieces. I noticed I didn't have this in the slides. I might have had it last week. Um, essentially, a composite attribute is an attribute made up of multiple pieces. A good example of that is an address because it has a street address, it has a city, it has a state, province, whatever you want to call it, and a postal code of some sort. So you can actually mark it as a composite and it'll actually mark it in the diagram as a composite. And what's cool, if you really want to get fancy, So as we move the teacher, everything moves with it. So 
that's the composite. And it has a few other attribute types which are kind of nifty. Um, it has a derived attribute. A derived attribute is something that you can calculate based on st other stuff in the database. A perfect example of that is age. Never store a person's age in the database. Why? Because you have to update it every year. Store their date of birth. Why? Because you can go now minus date of birth gives you how old they are. Date math sucks really hard. Just so you know, there's no harder math on earth than date math. Other than, you know, astrophysics. But date math is terrible. Uh, because, you know, there's leap years and miscellaneous other fun things in there. But it, a derived attribute, you can be marked in this too. Um, you can also mark these, the relationship type as an identifying relationship, which will do the appropriate diagram. So you know how in the other style of diagram, you got the dashed or the solid line. This is the original version of a conceptual diagram. And that's an identifying relationship because it's, it's marked as such. And if you want to mark something as a weak entity, you can mark it as a weak entity. It'll actually identify it visually. So double check with your lab prof when you start doing the diagramming. See which flavor of diagram they want. If they want the vertical box one, or if he'd accept the old style Chen style diagram. Because if he accepts the old style Chen diagram, this is the tool. Um, and what's cool too is you can actually export and it'll export it for you. So you don't need to do a screen grab. It'll actually do a proper export. Um, in theory, there's other tools with it, but that's what it can do. So that's the one I wanted to make sure I covered with you guys um, as a good tool. Like I said, double check with your lab prof, which style diagram they expect. Uh, I'm pretty sure a lab will accept either one. Doug, on the other hand, may not. I've worked with Alem before, so that's why I know he's pretty like that. I've never had Doug do my labs before, so it's a bit of a mystery. Well, I mean, he might be completely acceptable of it, right? They're both considered valid. It just depends on which one he expects to receive. That's all. Okay. All right, so the database design, now we're going to start talking about taking that conceptual diagram, converting it towards a physical diagram. Um, so a conceptual diagram is non-database system specific. Uh, so a data model or a conceptual diagram is not specific, whereas a database design is database specific. A database design is known as a physical diagram. Um, it's designed, basically, you are going to be creating something that is specific to the engine. Like I said earlier, each database engine has its features that it does and does not support. Uh, some don't support a lot of features. Some support a lot of features. MySQL is very basic. It supports some features. Postgres is very advanced. It supports a lot of features. Oracle supports a lot of features if you're willing to pay for it. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server is actually pretty flexible right out of the box. But if you want more features, you pay for the, you pay extra. I'm not saying you get it for free. But you pay lots more for more lots more features. So depending on what it is you're implementing in, you'll have more or less features. So a database design is the logical design plus some physical design. So in other words, the we already identified with conceptual is we talked about logical and the physical. So what we're going to talk about in this like well for the rest of this lecture is the logical design plus some of the physical elements. So basically, there's not a lot of difference between a logical design and a physical design. It's just the physical design implements specific functionality, like data types. Not all database servers have the same data types. Just like Java doesn't have all the same data types as, say, C++. C++ have certain kinds of data types. Java has different kinds of data types. They have some that are shared, but they will each have their own things. So 
when we're doing the physical design, there's a few requirement gatherings, such as business rules. We do normalization, then we do the diagramming. So when we're doing the database design, we get the rules first, we normalize, and we, we diagram. So a business rule, and I can guarantee this probably shows up on a test, just so you know. So a business rule is a statement of policy. It describes the operations and what a process validates. But what it does not do is it doesn't describe how the rule is enforced, conducted, or implemented. So an example of that is a business rule would be an employee must belong to a department. That's a good business rule. Why is it a good business rule? Because it's atomic. It's self-contained. It doesn't depend on any other rule. It is clear and declarative, as they say. In other words, it's a statement that is very easy to understand. However, it does not describe how the employee gets assigned to a department. Who decides what department that employee belongs to? It has nothing to do with the business rules. Business rules describe the rules of the data, not how the business conducts its business. So why do we want business rules? Business rules are set up so that an organization can achieve its goals and objectives when designing a database. Business rules can apply to people, businesses, systems, corporate behavior. In other words, the business rules can apply to anything that has to do with that database. An example of a discount rule, so a business rule, so buyer's discount rule. So a rule would be um, an organization named ABC may have a policy to give customers to purchase items worth $5,000 or more in a year, a discount on the other purchases. So if you spend X amount of dollars, you'll get a percentage off the next. So you spend 5000 you might get 3% off the next 2000 5% off the next 2000 after that. Those are known as price breaks. So the rule could be stated as something as follows. If a customer spends about 5000 in a given year, then give a 10% discount on each item purchased by the customer thereafter. Um, so that is a, an example of a business rule. It doesn't say how the 10% is going to get implemented. All it states specifically is who, the threshold, and what is applied. So business rules are the foundation of a data model. They represent the language and structure of the organization. Um, they're derived by, you know, events and functionality and stuff like that. Um, business constraints are specified in the business rules. And it's a formal way for stakeholders in an organization to understand how things work. And honestly, I'm not a fan of this particular business rule as an example because it's actually exceptionally wordy. This honestly would be um, a good way to write a rule of operation, but not necessarily a rule. So business rules determine data in the creation, storage, and retrieval. In other words, how the rules are written will determine how the database operates. If the rule is set in such a way that says an employee must belong to a department, therefore, when the employee is created, it must be a, the employee must be assigned a department. Those are known as constraints. An employee cannot exist without a department because the rule states an employee must have, have a must belong to a department. Vice versa, a department must have at least one employee. That will also determine the constraints of the relationship. These rules are integral to the design of a database. Um, and I'm going to skip the last point because that's like the third time that's been brought up what it's based on. So this is another nice dense slide. Uh, it's probably almost impossible to read for people at the back. Um, so business rules, there's characteristics, and these are the ones that are at this is what this is the important slide about business rules, by the way. A business rule must be declarative. I can never pronounce that word right. It just does not come out of my mouth. 
A business rule is a statement of policy and describes what the process validates, but does not describe how it is conducted or implemented. Again, an employee belongs to a department. Done. That's a business rule, short and sweet, succinct. Do not pass go. It's easy to understand. It is precise. A rule must have only one interpretation amongst all stakeholders. <laughs> and its meaning must be clear. Again, an employee must belong to a department. There's no two ways to interpret that. Everybody hearing that rule will understand that the employee must belong to a department. End of story. That is a precise rule. Atomic. The rule is indivisible, but self-sufficient. In other words, the rule is able to exist by itself without depending on anything else, and it is complete within its statement. Uh, usually, most business rules are written as a single sentence. Therefore, the sentence must express the entire rule. An employee must belong to a department. It doesn't depend on anything else. It's self-contained. And it is complete. It is consistent. A rule must be internally and externally consistent. In other words, a rule cannot contradict another rule. An employee must belong to a department. An employee may belong to zero or more departments. Okay, those two rules are contradictory. They're not consistent with each other because one says they might not belong to any departments. The other one says they must belong to a department. The many part is fine. Then you would actually take those two statements and combine into one and two. An employee may belong to one or more departments. It's expressible. A business rule must be stated in natural language without misinterpretation. So whatever language the business is operating in, when the business rule is said to a stakeholder, in other words, a developer goes to a manager that's in charge, the person that's in charge of the project, or maybe uh, some other stakeholders of the company, we're trying to do this, and they express the business rules to them. The other person must be able to understand it in plain insert language here. The phrase would be in plain English. In other words, you say it with simple words, and it must be understandable. An employee belongs to a department. Plain English. I mean, it's the best rule of all to explain this, right? It's expressible. It's understandable by everybody who understands the English language. And it is distinct. Business rules are not redundant. But it may refer to another rule. Now, you can refer to another rule, yes, which has nothing to do with the atomic part. However, the important one is that they're not redundant. So by earlier when I used the two different rules, right? An employee must belong to a department. An employee must belong to one or more departments. Technically, that second one is redundant because we're repeating one of the other rules. You take them together and make a single rule when you're done. So when we talk about business rules, this is the important slide that has to do with the business rules. It covers what a business rule, what the properties or the characteristics of a good business rule is. Um, I know for a fact in the first assignment, you guys are required to write up some business rules for whatever it is you're going to diagram. Remember these because you're going to be graded on this. Um, you're probably not going to get graded on spelling mistakes and that kind of stuff, but you will definitely be graded on, you know, good rules versus bad rules. Okay, so transforming a data model into a database design. So we've got an ERD, great. And when we wanna take that ERD and we wanna convert it to a database design, we will take each entity and create a table. So essentially our entities become tables. Tables are objects, physical objects in the database that actually contain the data. You're going to specify the primary key. You're welcome to use surrogate keys if it's appropriate, um, depending on which database uh, designer you talk to. We all have varying opinions about surrogate keys. I'm a big fan of surrogate keys. 
your lab profs might not be big fans of storing keys. Make sure you check with whoever is in charge of you. Whether it has to do with school or in the job in the workplace, always double check whether or not surrogate keys are acceptable or not. Uh, you may specify alternate keys, foreign keys, that kind of thing. Then you will transform the properties or the attributes into columns. So each attribute becomes a column, and it will have a few items tied to it. Is it nullable? In other words, is it optional? Can you store a null value? In other words, can you store the absence of value? In other words, can you fill it a value with, I don't know? You give it a data type. And uh, I will be talking about data types, I'm pretty sure later in this slides, uh, but you define the data types. Some of the common data types you will see are character fields or variable character fields or varying character fields or var card, depending on the database engine, all three of those are the same. Those are basically strings. You have integers, you have floats, you have dates, you have date time. You have, if you're lucky and a good database engine, you have booleans. MySQL does not have booleans. It has something else. A tiny int one. A tiny int one. A, a one digit long integer. Which means it is like when you ask your significant other what they want to go out to have for dinner. And they go, they give you an answer between zero and nine because they can't make up their mind. Realistically, you do zero and one, but MySQL actually allows you to have uh, 11 states of yes and no. Right? Zero to nine plus null. Whereas if you have a proper database system like Oracle, Postgres, My, basically everything but MySQL, you have proper Booleans which only, it's a ternary Boolean. True, false, and null. In other words, yes, no, I don't know. Much clearer. Um, you have default values. Potentially, you could have a default value. Uh, often, this will be used on a um, date time field, for example. You could default it to the current timestamp. In other words, when the record gets created, it immediately fills that value with the current date time. Uh, another one would be potentially a quantity field where you cannot sell a quantity of zero, so it will always default to one. And then data constraints. Back to my quantity field. In theory, you could set it to never allow zero. You could have a positive value. In theory, in an accounting system, you can have a negative value. Does anybody know why you'd have a negative value in an order in an accounting system? That's a refund. When you create an order and you do a negative one, that means you actually owe them money. And then you verify some normalization, which we'll talk about normalization next week. At this rate we're going through today, yes, it'll be next week. Okay, so then you're going to create relationships by placing the foreign keys. So you're actually going to create the keys between the objects. Um, you'll do identifying relationships, non-identifying relationships, relationships between strong entities. Uh, you may even have some mixed relationships in there. Um, which is kind of cool because I'm getting through this fast enough that next week I'll actually give you guys an example of doing this which is actually pretty good. Um, and then you're gonna specify the logic for enforcing the cardinality, optional, 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 many to optional, optional to many, and many to many. I mean, mandatory to mandatory. So in this case, the OM means optional or mandatory. Um, so when we had our original entity here, we turned it into a table like this. And as you can see, nothing changed, really. I mean, from one to the other, you look under the same, except for one thing, the key's been defined. Literally, that's the only difference between the two at this point. We have not assigned data types, we've not assigned constraint rules or anything of that nature. However, we took the conceptual diagram and we converted it 
to a logical diagram by literally, in this case, defining what the primary key is and assigning it. Now, if we were going from the other style of diagram, it'd be a much more obvious transformation. You'd go from, you know, a box with diamonds and bubbles to this. You'd see the transformation much more obviously. So after I'm done talking about primary keys, I think I'll pull the plug for this week. Um, so when you select the primary key, an ideal primary key is going to be short, numeric, and fixed. We try to avoid um, no long keys because they're slow to work with. So surrogate keys meet the ideal for a short, numeric, and fixed. In other words, it's numeric, yes, because it's surrogate, because it's a clicker, right? It's short because it's as small as the next biggest value, and it's fixed. In other words, it's never going to change. Um, some people feel that, however, there are disadvantages to surrogate keys. They have no meaning to an end user. Sure. However, It's theirs. You're laughing. I'm serious. Okay. Do you care what your student number is? Other than you know your student number. Honestly, do you care? Does it? Yes, but it has no meaning to you other than it's a number assigned to you. Right? Yeah, 040 and a bunch of other digits. Congratulations. It's a student number. Yay. Who cares? Order numbers. Order 55352. Congratulations. That's my order number. Do I care? No. My ID in the corporate database, my corporate overlords, I have an employee number. I don't even know what it is. I don't care. I know at the school because that's what I used to log in for my payroll. But at my other day job, I don't even know what my employee number is. It used to be 34. 34. Yeah, that went before we got bought out. My employee number was 34. I'd been there for a while. Could you tell? I think they got up to like 93 before they got bought out. So it's not like they had a lot of employees. But it means nothing. But some people say they have no meaning to the user. Honestly, if the user needs to know what the number is, it's either a flaw in the system or it's natural progression of the data. An order number. Great. You might not care what the order line number is. Who cares? You're not even going to see it. Usually surrogate keys are hidden from the user unless they actually have a valid reason to be there. The, the only other valid issue with surrogate keys is when the data is shared across multiple database systems. So you've got two databases. So you have three databases for products, which would be really dumb, but bear with me. And the same surrogate key must exist in all of them. That's when things go south because sword keys are automatically generated. So at that point, normally what happens is you'll have a master product database and that sword key value is put into the other ones as a uh, external ID. That's how you do it. So you just have to be careful. Uh, or you actually have the same database three times, which I have seen. Different business units are using the exact same database but they're independent from each other. So suddenly, you know, they might be a product 34 in one, which is a different product 34 from another one. And another business unit might not even have a product 34. So if you're using the exact same database structure multiple times within an organization, then there's potential for what they call key collisions. But honestly, having the same database three times in one company is stupid. You shouldn't do that. Design it so that that same database can be used by the all the business units so you don't have this problem. So, candidate keys and alternate keys are synonymous. So when we're doing design, we talk about candidate keys and alternate keys. Candidate keys are basically the alternate identifiers for a unique row. So this is a notation that's basically brought up in these slides. It may show up on a test and you'll probably never see again in your life. I'm just going to be completely honest, right? But it's a concept that you should at least understand. 
So in this, there's a, this notation called AK number number notation. And essentially, if we look at this at the employee, we know that we have an employee number. We could theoretically use an uh, email address as an alternate key. Later on, the alternate key does serve a purpose. It could be used to index the database. When I talk about indexes later in the term, so these are things you can use to find information in the database that you probably want to keep unique. In other words, you do not want two people at your company to have the same email address. We can all see how that could go horribly wrong. So email address is known as an alternate key. It can be potentially used as an identifier. So it's known as alternate key 1.1. And the customer number, we got name and city, alternate key 1.1, 1.2. And email address would be key 2.1. So in other words, we're saying that the combination of a customer's name and the city combined might be a unique identifier. So it's alternate key 1, element 1, element 2. Email address is an alternate key number 2, element 1. So that's what this is. So, you know. And I am going to stop right after the null status. Null status is whether or not the value of the column can be null, also known as an is it optional. When we think about employees, employee number is not null, just like your student number cannot be null. Your name cannot be null. An employee's name cannot be null, otherwise they're not an employee. Phone number theoretically could be null. It's entirely possible for someone to be in a system without a phone number. It's rare. I know it's shocking, isn't it? But in theory, somebody may not have a phone number. It happened it happen more than it does now. I mean, back when this textbook was first written, like this is the 16th edition, second edition was being published when I went through school. It was not unheard of for students to not have phone numbers. Why? Because we didn't all have cell phones. We didn't have cell phones. Well, some people had cell phones. People had lots of money. And sometimes you lived in an apartment and you didn't want to pay for the phone because the phone was like $100 a month, $80 a month for a phone just to do local calls. Therefore, craft dinner and hot dogs, telephone, food, not a hard decision. And with today's food prices, we're back to making those decisions. But so that's, you know, a phone number could be null. Email address theoretically could be null. Again, in today's day and age, email address being null is not very likely, but it's potential. Um, for an employee, the hire date is not null. When you hire someone, you know when they got hired. And again, with the employee, the email address in theory could be null because it hasn't been defined yet by the company. They've been hired but it hasn't gone through the IT department to create their email account yet. A bit like when they created my email account at my current new employer, they mangled my name. It makes me mad. They like, took one of the letters out of my first name. So D-A-I-E, skipped the L, and then it started on my last name. Apparently, it's just the rules of how they name people's email addresses. So it took me a, a hot minute to get used to typing that in. Review date could be null. Employee code could be null because they just got hired, so they haven't had a review yet. Uh, employee empl employee code, I don't know what that would be for, so theoretically null. So that's null. So null is used whether things are optional or not. In other words, is it mandatory or not? If it's mandatory, it's not null. If it's optional, it's null. And that's that. And I'm going to stop here because data types is a conversation. Excellent. So we got halfway through next week's lecture. Yeah, this content's not that, there's a lot of text, but not that much content. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.